Um, thank you, Jim. I didn't hear any of the introduction, but I got your last sentence, which is your handing over to me. Can you hear me well? I can hear you well enough, Jackie. Yes. Um, Good. Well, thank you very much indeed for the invitation. I'm very sorry not to be with you, actually. I had a, I've had a long-standing family engagement um, with people arriving between half past five and six. I just couldn't be there, but I, I'm very grateful for you reorganising the, the schedule for me, and I hope you have a fantastic conversation. Obviously, it's a pleasure to work with such a distinguished group. Um, you've and kind of... I want to say, I've come from a meeting over the corridor with your old friend Tony Mackay, joining from Australia. Um, oh, really? so, uh, and you came up in conversation there as well. So, you know, it's, it's, it's good to see you. It's a global dialogue, Jim. Um, look, I, I'm, I, I thought I'd do it, spend the 10 minutes you've kindly given me talking about um, the, obviously the future work, but mainly not, not the kind of distant future work, but the next five to 10 years and how we make sure people have the skills needed to, to do the work that needs to be done. Um, and I have two um, roles that relate directly to that. One is I'm advising the chancellors, it's, it's unpaid work, um, but formal, formally appointed to advise the chancellor on the skills agenda of government. And through that, I work with uh, Jeremy Hunt and Gillian Keegan uh, on their skills agenda. And then the second role I have is in my region. I live in Devon and I'm chair of the Southwest Social Mobility Commission, which is something set up by the University of Exeter, but brings all the businesses in the Southwest together. So we work with the Southwest Business Council. Uh, and you can see how the skills agenda and the social mobility agenda overlap. And the Southwest has a particular set of uh, questions, which I'll come to uh, now. One is the Southwest, surprisingly, maybe, or people find it surprising, has the lowest social mobility of any region in the country. Jim might remember that from his own constituency back in Poole. Uh, you get a lot of um, you get a lot of um, un low paid, unskilled jobs in tourism and agriculture in um, Devon, Cornwall, Somerset, um, and you have relatively low expectations in the school system and among families that goes with that. And West, North, sorry, West Somerset has the lowest social mobility of any region in the country. And I know that because in University of Exeter, we have the only professor of social mobility in the country. Um, uh, and uh, we do an annual report on social mobility in the Southwest starting last year when we published the follow up yesterday. Um, sorry, on Monday. So, um, and changing social mobility is actually about changing skills. And that means, therefore, anticipating the future of work, which is what you're all talking about. These things all go together. Um, and in the southwest, I'll start with that, and then I'll come to the the skills advice with the chancellor and Gillian Keegan in a minute. Um, the in the southwest, we if you anticipate the the jobs of the future or the skills needed of the future, there's big growth, and you're you're much better qualified than me to talk about this in the green area. Um, in North Devon, that turns into a levelling up grant in Appledore, where which is a small port on the North Devon coast. Where, uh, in collaboration with uh, with Belfast, uh, with some major companies, there's going to be a huge development in offshore wind, and then the offshore energy generated will be come on shore somewhere near Barnstable. And at the moment, we don't have the skills to do that. But if we got that right, there's a lot of people who are in and around Barnstable who would love higher paid jobs, but they need to get the skills to do that. Um, so that's one area. Second is high tech. Uh, digital area um, in and around North Devon. I mentioned that because I know it best because I live there. You will find dotted around rural North Devon in places like Tor Torrington and Barnstable and in between lots and lots of small, very high tech businesses. One of them, for example, is providing uh, the technology that the soft, the engineered um, software for the Kore uh, South Korean, I hasten to add, Korean Air Force um, and you know, and if, if those businesses were put around a roundabout in the east end of London, we'd call it a cluster. But we don't call it a cluster because it's distributed, but it's there. But they're finding it really difficult to get the skills from the local community. So the local college, Petroc, is beginning to work with them in an integrated way. I'm just giving the, the, these are some of the challenges of, uh, of making sure that we don't just anticipate the work of the future, but, but the, the, the people coming through our, our education system have the skills. Creative, if you look at the Southwest, 
everybody knows about St Ives and the Tate Gallery there. It's fantastic. And you see St Ives and it's a huge growth in, in art and design and all of that. There's a thing called in the box with a capital B in Plymouth, which is a big art centre and art gallery. Uh, the woman who's just come to run it used to run the Margate Centre, which is celebrating Turner's life and career and has been a big success in turning around Margate. So there's a whole set of areas in the creative. And when we when we talk about the school system and we focus purely on STEM, we miss some of that. It's a really big growth area um, and, and needs to be thought about in a conscious way. Um, and then there's advanced manufacturing, which is not an area normally associated with the Southwest, but there's a spaceport in New in, in Newquay. Uh, there's Babcock with uh, 10,000 employees in and around Plymouth. They say they've got a 50 year pipeline already locked in, but they don't know how the work will change over that 50 years. Uh, but 50 year order book, amazing. And then there's health and social care. I know you're familiar with all these things, um, but it, the, 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 the Royal Devon and Exeter, uh, the Plymouth Hospital, the new Exeter University campus in, uh, not newish, but growing campus with a big medical school in Truro. These are huge growth things. And then in Somerset, you've got the gravity site near Junction 25 on the M5, where uh, it's not absolutely signed, sealed and delivered, but Tata are going to build a big plant to, to build um, electric car batteries. Tata is a massive global company, as you know, uh, and that will provide a lot of jobs. But in Bridgewater and Minehead, they're not, there aren't the people at the moment with the skills to do those jobs, so they need to be upskilled. So I'm just I'm just giving you my region, but you could we could tell this story. For, for the different regions, but there's lots and lots of growth areas where we need to get the skills agenda to keep up if we're going to if, if we're going to benefit in economic terms for those regions and in social mobility terms for those regions to make the most of these growing job areas. And final final point from me, and then um, and then I'm happy to answer questions on on the skills agenda for the the work I'm doing with Gillian Keegan and Jeremy Hunt. A very important fact in that is they, they talk about having a 10 year strategy, but they of course they know there's an election in 2024. Um, and what's good about the skills area and hardly and that's one of the reasons it hardly appears in the media is actually the 2022 legislation, which was brought into Parliament by Gavin Williamson, had cross party support. Uh, the Skills Act went through with cross party support. If you read, I'm sure some of you have, I know, I'm sure Jim will have done David Blunkett's report on skills for the Labour Party in, uh, I think it was in December, and look at the skills part of that. Uh, it's broadly consistent with what the government is actually doing. This is very, very, very important because I've done two big events in with employers, one with the Chancellor and others in London about two weeks ago with very leading businesses present. And what they were saying is, this agenda is broadly right. Of course, there's lots of uh, things they can change and re refine and tinker with, but this, this skills agenda is broadly right. Please don't change the framework again. Don't abolish T levels. Don't uh, get rid of the boot camps, etc., uh, and so on. So th this, this is that that that's their message. And the other thing they they understand now because we've challenged them radically is you can't keep saying, what's the government doing about skills? You businesses have to tell us what you're doing about skills because you invest half as much in your own workforce as German or French companies do. And they understand that. So there's a real tipping point arriving. And then on Monday, I was with the leaders of the business community in the Southwest, uh, two or 300 people in Exeter, and they're fired up for this as well. So we actually have a real opportunity, uh, but we need the 10 year strategy. And that means we need to get enough cross-party consensus to be able to take this through. And strategies sound a bit vague, but if you look back over educational history in the last 30 years, we've done this before. In 1995, we were bottom of the EU league table on preschool education. By 2005 or six or seven, when Jim was an education minister, we were top of it, or pretty much top. We had Sure Start, we had a big expansion of uh, provision for three and four year olds. Uh, it got hit by austerity, but Jeremy Hunt put significant money into this area in the recent budget. Uh, but we did it over a 10 year period. Similarly, uh, on primary school literacy and numeracy, we're fourth in the world. We're first in Europe. Uh, we're ahead of Finland on any uh, international comparison you'd like to mention. And that didn't happen by accident either. 
Um, obviously, the current government um, puts it all down to Michael Gove and Nick Gibb. Uh, others would say it goes back to David Blunkett and me and Estelle and uh, and then later Jim. And the literacy and numeracy strands, we, we were, we were in, in 1996, I don't mean a, a, we were, we, the literacy in primary schools was the same as it was in 1948. So 50 years it had stayed the same and now we've gone right up the ranking. I'm just mentioning these things because if we get a consistent 10 year approach to skills, we can be as good as Germany. We don't have to have another report like the ones in 1884 and all the ones since saying, why can't we be as good as Germans? We can be as good as Germans, but we do need a steady framework. So we need any incoming government, whether it's a re-elected government or a, uh, a new party in control or a coalition, whatever it might be, we need them to stick to the skills agenda. One of the great things, um, and obviously there's lots of other stuff happening in government, one of the rare things in the present government is you have a prime minister, a chancellor, a secretary of state for education and a minister of state for skills and higher education, all of whom within education prioritise skills ahead of universities and ahead of schools. That's never happened before. It's, it creates challenges, but it's it's an opportunity. So what's there? This is, this is um, what I want to finish on. First of all, there's a big drive to improve careers advice in school uh, based on a report that David Sainsbury did in 2015 um, and is really good. And I know he's talking to people across parties about continuing that. It's beginning to work. It's got a long way to go. On that, UCAS, for the first time this summer, UCAS will advise not just students, not just on which universities to go to, but how to get into apprenticeships and degree apprenticeships. Um, I'm Chancellor of Exeter University. We have the most degree apprenticeships of any Russell Group University in the country. Um, and 91% of people complete those apprenticeships. So careers advice is important. UCAS is important. The expansion of the apprenticeship program is important. Degree apprenticeships are really important. T levels are still in their early stages, but they're beginning to work and uh, that they will make a difference. And the universities are beginning to recognize them uh, as equivalents of, of A levels um, and they're a route into uh, degree apprenticeships and other things. Every region 38 of them now across the country has an employer representative body that is creating the demand the idea that the, the slogan is a demand-led skill system they're expressing the demand and the education system in those areas is responding um so for, for example the, the southwest institute of technology which connects the universities plymouth and exeter to um and falmouth to, to, to the colleges is beginning to do that um and finally there are the boot camps which um, in um, three months, uh, sometimes three months, but sometimes less, give people a skill that gets them into a job. Uh, and there are lots of uh, young people I met recently where that's proven. And, and by the way, they're not just young people. When we talked with the German government at, the, uh, at the, um, their embassy recently, they, they obviously they've got lots to admire and there's lots we've got to catch up on. Them. But one of the things they like is our system is a bit more flexible and our apprenticeship scheme is for people of all ages, not just young people. This is really important. So I'm trying to put a kind of positive um, approach to this, where if we were to build on this, refine it, strengthen it, learn as we go, we could match anybody in the world in 10 years if we got on with it. And if we had the skills right, then we can get the jobs filled uh, and then we can uh, deal with social mobility. Uh, thanks very much, Michael. M Michael can only stay until half past five. So what I'm going to do is just ask him a few questions and respond before bringing in the other speakers, if that's OK with everybody. Um, and uh, as, a, as a former minister of the South West uh, back in the day, um, I was delighted to get that little uh, rundown of what's going on uh, across the region. and. Um, it's a it's a useful case study for us, but uh, I want to get into the, the sort of capability approach a little bit um, that uh, largely would be the focus of this meeting. But before I get there, I can't help but ask you, Michael, whether or not uh, you know. The Leader of the Opposition tomorrow, and I've seen a little bit of this speech, and what Veer is going to talk about, amongst other things, is, is the purpose of schooling and the need to broaden the curriculum in order to bring in more um, application of knowledge alongside a, a continued rigorous approach to knowledge. Um, and how much is 
a school system that's not aligned and not allowing room for technical skill, a sort of dragging anchor on uh, achieving the ambition that you want of yeah. being one of the leading countries of skills in 10 years time. Yeah, it's 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 a it's a it's a big issue, and I think we, um, I, I I'm often quoted saying that the road to hell in education is paved with false dichotomies, and this is one of them. But and I've I've debated. Yeah. Yeah. So and I've I've talked with um, current and past government ministers in the last decade about this because they, um, that I I actually like their emphasis on knowledge. But the idea that that is to the exclusion of skills is nonsense. So Pythagoras's theorem is that knowledge or skills. It's, it's you can know it, but unless you can use it, um, and that at which point it becomes a skill, it's kind of it's a pointless division. So I I, I would uh, I I have no idea what um, Keir Starmer's speech is going to do tomorrow. But if it if it promotes knowledge alongside skills, um, that would be good or skills alongside knowledge. And the, the other thing which, which uh, it was it was interesting, and I, I, I was glad with the language you used, we used to all through the 20th century and well into this century talk about the academic vocational divide. But actually in any line of work and any form of education, those words kind of get in the way. The, the, some of the most academic courses in top universities like law or medicine or engineering are clearly vocational. So it, it's, it, we, we kind of get we get ourselves caught up in the wrong words, but the the real division or the real thing to think about is theoretical and applied, and you can you can get into engineering through plumbing, for example, so mainly application, but in the end you're going to need to know the theory of how water runs through systems and all of those things and the and the, the chemistry of all of that, and um, and any course of education, whether in school or afterwards, is going to have it needs a combination of the applied element of it and the theoretical element of it. And one is knowledge and the other is skills. And uh, that balance will change over time. If you do law at um, Sheffield Hallam University, you get a lot of experience working in citizens and vice bureau as a way into legal things. And then you learn the theory. If you do law at Oxford, you probably start with the theory and then do the practice. But either way, you've got to do both. And that, I think we, we need to think differently about this combination of theoretical and applied and where it starts and um, where it finishes and what order you do those things in. But if the school system started that in an integrated way, that would be great. Thank you. Good. Um, so then just projecting where things are going, you know, the, the debate has been uh, lit up in a way by uh, generative AI, large language models, what, um, what AI might now do to the labour market. And too often it becomes a debate about de-skilling and about people losing jobs. And there's an interesting challenge that I'd, I'd love your reflection on, uh, that we could think about it differently. Can we think more about the quality of work? Can we think more about how we give workers more agency about in their work? Can we think more about the, the opportunity uh, around work? Um, and, and and I guess how that then links into a more sustainable economy uh, and one where we can, that's also part of a, re a reframing of the, of the economic model of the state, where we need more people to be working and we need more people paying in than are taking out. And, um, and that requires us to move on from beverages thinking into something new and is is the AI revolution an opportunity for us to grab something that can help us do what was previously inconceivable and unimaginable? Well, I, I need to qualify this. So I want to give a one word answer, which is yes, but the but I, I'm not really, I wouldn't consider myself remotely well informed on, on AI and the speed of development. Um, uh, there and there's obviously aspects of that that go into deep, profound uh, ethical questions. Uh, so, but but I do think that going into this new future with that um, 
optimistic, but I, I don't mean wildly optimistic. That op the, the, the basically optimistic perspective that here is an opportunity to redefine work, redefine the role of the state, and redefine find the way the economy works. Yes, I think that will be easy because I think you, you, it, these things aren't. Sometimes people people talk about the future as if it's inevitable, but the future will, will be what we make it. So we will make decisions, and they'll. They, they will make the future. So if, if you go into it with the right frame of mind, and I think the way you described it, Jim, is the right frame of mind, and you might be accused of being, or you know, anybody, and I, I, I would be more than happy to, to use those words. People who take that view will be accused, you know, there'll be a cynical view. Yeah, you're not real, you, you don't know, and all the negativity that comes with it. But I do think if we ask the right questions and we have an optimistic frame of mind, there is a real opportunity to, to redefine work. But what is very clear in that is, you, People without skills, without language skills, without relationship skills, without the combination of um, knowledge and skills that we were talking about, will be excluded. So we, because the the big risk is that you just leave it may be a minority, but it could be a significant minority behind as that the world that you describe unfolds. And so the way the school system works, the way we give people second chances, I think the lifelong learning entitlement that's going through Parliament. Uh, now uh, again has cross-party support. It's a real opportunity to give people a right to upskilling throughout their lives. And if we grasp that lifelong learning entitlement opportunity, there's an implication that we modularise quite a lot more of the qualification landscape. Is our higher and further education um, ecosystem uh, ready for that um, or are we sort of bravely asserting through a funding mechanism that something good will follow from our qualification and education institution world well, I, i'm i so i've i've tried i um had a um, conversation with the uk the, the universities group i don't think the universities are ready for LLE. i don't think they have modularized things in the way that you're rightly saying they need to do i think they think it'll just be another way of um, paying, I'm, I'm exaggerating slightly, of being able to carry on, but with a different funding model. And I don't think that will work, or I don't think we'll get the opportunity from it if that's the way we go into it. So I, I think there is more to do. I think actually some of the more innovative colleges are doing some really good thinking on that. And I think the, I personally um, would support having a post-18 regulatory system that applied to all post-18 learning rather than a separate university regulator. I was chairman of the IFS, as you know, um, and um, I always said, because the Philip Auger review said have a post-18 regulatory system, I always said to government and anybody who wanted to talk about that, that we would happily um, uh, fold ourselves up and go away, or or if, they, if other people wanted to run a post-18 education system where you had the, the, the this modular approach and you had a funding approach that was consistent across skills and uh, you know the, the the skills and colleges agenda and the apprenticeships agenda as well as the universities and degrees agenda. I think that would be fantastic. You'd have to get the detail right, but it would be huge. Yeah. Um, before we let you go, I'll give one person the opportunity to ask one burning question for Michael, if if there is one, uh, and then we'll we'll yeah. move on. And we can engage again if, if it's of any use to you, but I, I know there's so much running in this conversation, I'm very sad to miss it. Just sorry, yes. if I can, uh, Aaron Rubber from World Schools UK. Um, just speaking to your experience, Mike, in the Southwest, uh, businesses like Tata, the South Korean military, what it speaks to to me is the importance of skills to inward investment. And that's what our own research has found. And that's what uh, the EY annual attractiveness survey has found, um, is that multinational companies when choosing where to invest in and locate really prize access to technical skills so when we're thinking about big emerging global industries like clean tech advanced manufacturing the skill supply from the uk side is really really important from a, from a policy perspective what it means is that we need closer alignment between skills and inward investment policy uh, both at a national level and also at a local level we're using uh, the new local skills improvement plans that are being developed so what I was going to ask you, Michael, was that in addition to uh, Jeremy Hunt and Gillian Keegan, whether or not Kemi Badenoch and colleagues from the DBT were also involved in your discussions around skills and whether or not inward investment was part of 
part of your thinking? Because yeah, it's, it's a really good question actually, and I I totally agree with your premise. You know, the, the way you led to the question, Kemi uh, Badlock did come to the conference I mentioned with employers in um, in the QE2 um, a couple of weeks ago, um, and and so she she is involved, but not probably not as involved. And, and, and I, this this may be my fault, but not as involved as I think um, your question implies she and her department should be. And I think we should probably do more on that. There, it has also been um, a theme at cabinet. So it's not just the, the, those two uh, cabinet ministers that are leading on it, that it's it's got a kind of cabinet thinking behind it. But I, I do think there's more to do. And there's a government review currently of um, how to how to attract inward investment more, um, and that review I, I've spoken to. Um. Um, Michael, thank you so much for joining. Enjoy your uh, time with it, um, and uh, we will, I'm sure, we will send you up on your offer of further engagement at Dan Trump. And I'll see you soon, Mike. Yes, thank, thank you all. Thank you all very much for your time, and sorry for disrupting your schedule, and look forward to further conversation. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, uh, Elisa, I'm not going to do. Uh, what's your name? Um, so, so, a couple of things I think when you've done a, in, in thinking about so this 10 year strategy, and I think when we talk about policy making in the future, I'd like to look at our record in the past. So I'll give you a couple of numbers. The first World Conference on the Environment was held in Stockholm in 1972. So that's more than 50 years ago. And yet, since then, until today, CO2 emissions have still increased by about 90%. The first World Assembly on Aging was held in Vienna in 1982. It's about 40 years ago. And by 2030, that's less than seven years, in seven years, when it takes people to be over 60 years. So, um, and I think, you know, we've known about the existence of these mega trends, and I think it's quite interesting when we're talking now about AI to see what it is that we can do, but it is that we can do, but will we be held accountable to share? Um, and so I think, you know, we have certainly attempted to resolve all of these mega trends and uh, to reduce their impact, but we haven't succeeded. So I think. Looking forward might be interesting to think about where we have not been able and what we haven't been able. And um, whether we're talking about climate change and uh, the aging population, now we're to validation with that impact the data projects and their dynamic skills. Um, so some of these impacts can be negative. Well, I think there's tons of headlines and others, and I don't want to go into those uh, on the average across the city countries. We have seen that occupations at the highest base of automation uh, account for about 28% of employment. This is expert views around this. Um, at the same time, we've seen as well that some of these impacts can be positive. And uh, uh, the International Labor Organization predicts, for instance, that, um, that job creation of about 25 million jobs by 2030. Uh, due to some of these mega trends. So, regardless of the nature of the impact, uh, the, in, the workers will attach to that. And I think that's one of the, the main issues where we might want to look into how we do that. So, so for us, what do the future skills be? The future skill is one of lifelong learning, basically. It's, and it's one in which the foundational skills, which we define as uh, literacy, numeracy, digital skills, so these are foundational skills for us. Social emotional skills, um, whether it's uh, consciousness, responsibility, empathy, self efficacy, uh, collaboration, transversal cognitive and metacognitive skills, uh, so all of the bunch of critical thinking, uh, problem solving, all of that, and the professional technical. Uh, and specialized knowledge are learned and relearned uh, throughout an individual's life. And I think, you know, that's also where this lifelong entitlement is. But essential, I think, um, for the upskilling and reskilling is, is for us, for instance, particularly the, the shorter program, so the vocational education training uh, in the UK. And um, for, uh, where we, I think, could be interesting is um, that the impact, uh, 
the impact will have to look at a much more targeted approach in terms of who does it affect, to what extent, what does that mean? So I'll give you a couple of numbers as well. Across OECD regions, about 72% of green tax jobs are held by men. And I talk a lot about green because for us, there is a twin transition of green and digital. And looking at one separately may not give us the right view. What would affect and impact the other? Um, so less than a third of tasks directly relating to improving environmental sustainability are held by women. So this has to change. So already we're starting from the onset of of inequality uh, that I think would be interesting. So what should this 10 year uh, strategy that, that was just talked about? I think, of course, reducing skills imbalances, and there is really the regional lens is particularly important. I don't think we can no longer look into a national trend solely. Um, creating the culture of lifelong learning is extremely difficult. What we're seeing across the region of countries is that people who have access to training uh, don't take it up. So we have to see why. But you know, we're looking into this more and more. There are some indications of why this is not happening, but a lot of it has to do with the value of it by employers. People don't go into the training that they don't see a direct impact uh, in their employment in terms of career progression, remuneration, flexibility, uh, and knowledge that is, and, and also a commitment to, to the work they're doing. Transforming the workplaces is something as well. I think that should be the uh, to, to make a better use of skill. I don't think we're, we're at that stage yet. So, for instance, uh, ensuring as well that the, the SMEs are not left behind in the same revolution that we're talking about, where most of the discussions are led by computer scientists and large companies. That's why we're talking about. And then, of course, strengthening the governance of skills policy. I think that's something that will be essential here. Uh, um, if, if looking, you know, particularly the coordination of skills. And I can tell you this: we, we're at the OCD Center for Skills. We, we work with tons of ministries, and we always say there's no ministry of skill per se in many countries. And that means something to education, employment, economy, innovation, digital, uh, uh, regional developments, and it just is the mirror of what can work and what doesn't work in government uh, when it comes to that. So I don't think it's, it's possible to predict the development of the demand for skills with certainly, but um, that's one thing we can we can think about is really looking into these, these aspects that I just mentioned and um, and I do hope that we don't take the path of the environment and uh, the aging population conferences. <laughs> It's very good. Um, got so much to say, but I'm not going to say it for that. Um, I'm going to go to Jeremy. If we need to get a point of time. Um, thank you. That, that was really interesting. Uh, <laughs> I think I'm going to be the voice of optimism for a moment, if I may. Firstly, um, I'm going to bring back in uh, your like you mentioned the capabilities approach, and uh, I, mean, I think it's probably not useful to use the language, but let's talk about human potential and development of human potential and human flourishing, which is really the point of what we do with all of this. And I um, have a slight reluctance to engage in. Oh, I'm going to be disliked. You can call me whatever you like after this. I'm going to change my name anyway. Um, a, a slight reluctance to engage with one must be skilled, or you have to adapt or leave, because we are talking about people with free will and we're talking about aging populations. We are seeing early retirees, we are seeing people opt out of employment entirely or, or, or minimizing their engagement in the workforce. People don't have to do anything. People will find ways around doing tasks that they do not feel able to do mastery over the potential to achieve. So, so I'd like to pause and say that I am 
I'm lucky enough to be part of an ongoing piece of work where we're trying to understand how people receive technology. And I accepted a lot of resistance in our early quality of work. I accepted it's here, it's awful, it's monitoring us, it can not have to learn new things, and I hate it. Instead, what we got was possibly Chris and one French group only. Um, but what we got was really overwhelmingly positive. If we can see the benefits. If it makes our lives easier, if you support us through this, we want to be competitive, we want to be efficient. And actually, investment in technology by employees, firms, was seen as a sign that those firms were succeeding. We work for a company that's successful. We work for a company that's at the edge. We work for a company that's leading the way. So this is all the good stuff. The good stuff is technology isn't necessarily overlaid with negative connotations, the type of connotations that often dominate these types of conversations. Not in the workplace, as far as we can tell, yet, of course, there's some concern about it being monitoring technology. Um, although there's, there, there are suggestions for getting around that. There's some concern about how might we transition? If we need to learn this new stuff, are we up to it? Can we do it? And within this education, the skills agenda, I think we're missing a trick because so much of what we're learning about, and I'm going to call it transition skills rather than skills of education, let's say, is quite micro. I mean, you've you, you talked about modular learning, it's even smaller than that. It's really short adaptation skills, quite handheld, quite focused, really quite bespoke. And at the moment, that's been left in the discussion of firms. And so it's ad hoc. It's sketching on and it isn't integrated into any sort of framework for support, which means we are losing the opportunity of human flourishing. But people want, they want to feel part of that transition, they want to feel taken along with that transition. And I think I mean, the workforce will manage still to engage. People we have lost along the way, so we need to re engage by convincing them. They will not be forced to learn skills that they don't want to learn or they cannot see the points of, but they will be engaged in a discussion about the usefulness of transition, that they will be asked to bring their own potentials and to expand those potentials. So we think we've got to really stop pitting man against machine, person against technologies, and look at ways of implementing those two parts for a better future. Because at the moment, quite a lot of the dialogue is like, oh, so it's the goals like us, and it's paving our ways out. I'm going to be sad a lot too. Yeah. Um, but I think that's my whole thing. Thank you. Uh, that's very uh, good. Uh, and nice to have a balance of COVID. Mark. Hey, thanks. But just want to start by making a comment on, I guess, skills strategy in the UK from a policy perspective overall. I think the focus on tenure planning is to be relevant because if the UK skills system is characterised by anything, it's constant reinvention and reinvention at a really long period of time. Yeah. I think there's been a skill that's paid for every two or three years across 20 or so years. Um, and it's interesting to hear the focus now on lifelong learning because that just reminds me of debates in the late 1990s, early 2000s, particularly the learning age not technically from the, the late governments. We do seem to be uh, going back to the past a little bit, but hopefully this time to be to a more consistent and stable future because when we look at some of our competitors, that's what they have. They're completely well defined training systems that can adapt rather than constantly trying to change things all the time. Uh, and that causes issues with employers. It's employers often don't know what's going on. Uh, but clearly, employers being at the heart of skills strategies in the UK for the past 30 or so years. And this has to be constantly reinforced that employers should be central to this. So, what I want to talk about is a little bit uh, from our own research about what companies are currently doing in relation to digital automation. Um, and skills have issues. And I want to draw from a survey that we just uh, conducted of 2000 UK employers. It's a nationally representative survey. It was probably one of the most qualitative set of findings in terms of technology and uh, working practices in relation to technology that's, that's available at the moment. So we might expect. Um, the first thing, when we talk about digitalization, and automation. We have to recognise that 
this isn't homogenous. There are many different types of technologies. And one of the things that we looked at is the diversity of technologies that are available and employers are investing in using. And this matters because there's significant um, variation in terms of levels of investment by the technology. So if you look at traditional ICT, like computers, um, iPads, phones, then 90% of employees have invested in this type of technology in the past five years, and it's widely used by employees. When you start to look at more advanced forms of digital adoption, this is much less widespread. So in the last five years, around 40% of employers have invested in data analytics, and just over a third of invested in what you might consider to be more advanced types of AI enabled technologies. And even when you drill down to that one third that has invested in this most more advanced types of AI enabled technologies, it's more likely to be cloud computing than robots. Key issues that drive this variation include the size of firms, what of firms best, and also the particular types of sectors. But what we're starting to see is a clear divide between what we might call digital adopters and non adopters. Those that are digital adopters that are investing in more advanced forms of technology are more likely to say that they're going to invest in this type of technology in the future. Those firms that haven't invested in the last five years, you might think, well, okay, they're waiting to invest in the future. That doesn't seem to be the case. Only 10%. But non adopters say that they will be a talking in the future. So we're starting to get this sort of divide between technology advanced companies, non technology advanced companies, and that divide potentially is going to grow. When we look at one of the implications of this for the workforce, and we talk about the capability of virtual we're talking about opportunities, right? And those opportunities have to be real, so I can send it's very clear, yeah? And I think looking at what's happening in companies is quite important here. The points already been made. Job quality is more important than job quality in terms of something to look at. And what we found is I don't think there's anything at the moment to be fundamentally scared about in terms of where companies are investing in digital automation, that this is going to lead to job destruction in an aggregate sense. Actually, what we find is digital adopters are more likely to be associated with jobs growth in the past and also potential jobs growth in the future. Turning to skills, digital adopters are also more likely to be engaged in digital skills training. But what we found overall is that levels of skills training for digital are quite low overall. And I think this fits with a general pattern in the UK have relatively low levels of training. Training in terms of all training, so we might think of on off the job instruction of the digital skills, now we have less than 10% of firms that invest in this in the last few years. It's typically on the job training. Um, and those companies that have invested digitally are more likely to engage on the job training than firms that haven't. Intriguingly, when you ask firms what are the challenges they face in terms of investing in digital technology. Those that have invested say that skills are a real problem. They face challenges around skills. So of those that haven't invested, so they don't invest because of issues around skills. Um, but when you ask them how important do you think skills investment will be in the next few years, do you intend to make a lot of investments in digital skills training in the next few years? Very few companies say they're going to be investing heavily in digital skills training in the next few years. In fact, if we ask, are you going to invest a lot in the next few years? I think mean, 100% of companies that are investing in digital technology say they'll be investing a lot in training. Those are having invested in switching. And this was despite the fact that they folks were reporting difficulties in recruiting people with the right skills in terms of technological skills. And that didn't even matter that they were digital adopters. Maybe three quarters of firms said that they had difficulties, a lot of difficulties, or some difficulties recruiting people with the right skills. But at the same time, they were planning to invest heavily in their skills themselves. So I think that poses quite a fundamental challenge 
water based land, which is still a strategy. Just a couple of points in terms of opportunities and, and, and uh, I guess employee agency. Um, we didn't find the high levels of digital control or technological control of employees. Those kinds of investment in technology were more likely to say that they have a sort of autonomy to work, they're sort of working teams. Also, in terms of involvement in decision making, then companies that are investing in technology are more likely to say they invest in, they involve their employees in a whole range of workforce force decisions, including around training and including around technology. But in terms of, I guess, building a good approach to automation that involves workers in those decisions, it's interesting when you want to develop workers' decisions, investment in technology is the lowest area of this involved. So, yes, quite big challenges. Good, thank you. Uh, I can't not just say at the end there, Mark. I wonder if you repeated the survey the same organisation, but asked the employees and not the employers whether you would get certain losses. But uh, I just I will um, use that chat permission to get some reactions to straight questions. Um, at least I thought what you have said was really, really interesting. Um, it brought out all of my bias uh, around thinking about things from a school's lens and a lot. And since that, some of these behaviors and adults, I fear, are set in school. So if, you, if you've gone to school and you've been asked, what are you going to do when you grow up? And you've got a presumption that you do education and then you stop and then you go into work and you, that education has prepared you for a single career, not prepared you with the resilience and the learning skills and the self-directed learning skills to keep changing careers. Then when you sort of fall, and yeah, when you become disabled or when you're either out of work, Training is it's just not instinctive to you because that's just not the way you've been the way you've been brought up. And you know, one of the things I've noticed today was um, with um, a, a charity called the Class of Your Own, and they ten years ago developed a design engineering construction qualification for young people so that they could get involved in the construction of new schools and through designing new schools with architects, they understood the professions associated with construction. Uh, and I've just met people 10 years old who are costly surveyors, who are architects, who are uh, civil engineers, who are doing a range of different professions as a result of that qualification. And there's a different way of learning, and a lot of them built. And the sense that our we set a path for people's perceptions of occupations of who data analysts are, who engineers are, by gender, by ethnicity, at school. And then we really struggle thereafter. And that's created a, a, a rigidity in the labor market uh, that we're then having to try and unpick with adults um, right now. And that's, that's very hard. So that's just that's one of the question on that. Um, and Jolene uh, yeah, got excited about not only about micro learning, but also possibly, um, you know, we need to help people form positive, trusting relationships with each other and with the environment and with machines, and then we might have a from people. But the sense that if we give people agency over their work and they are choosing to be less productive, but to do what works for them. There's actually something positive in that. Because that, that yes. might be you, that might be more safe for the, for the environment and for, for our world. And that might be a good thing. Some of this is Dr. Benzema. If you've got people leaving the workplace and yeah. being alienated, your productivity is, is nil. Yeah. So I think you've got to think about re engaging the workforce. Yeah. Um, and, and so far, we are speaking, we, are, we have got a uh, employee note survey, but we have to report that on everyone's. We've got policy to work with employees, and 
And that sense of mastery was a real sense of accomplishment when it was achieved. And finally, my question was I'm worried a bit about the end of the world. Really, we need to let the market fit around skills and what the world is needing. But I, I'm worried that, you know, if you take food as an example, the food sector. We desperately need quite a lot of change and a lot of innovation with the good sector in terms of the sustainability of the planet. Um, but if you go to the people, my sense is if you go to employers in the food sector, they're going to have a lot of carry on and they're probably really less than capital of the people. Um, and they're carrying on trying to do things the way they've been doing them and more efficient. They're not going to be going, to look, okay, how are we going to do it radically? Um, and an employer let system might not allow us to develop the real future skills that uh, the, the, the challenges that we face uh, might need. Um, and so I suppose there's a sort of central bit where there's some sectors where we need to go beyond what employers want. Uh, and, but they bring uh, about uh, a lot of about employers essentially being more inclined to invest in capital. Than in people's skills is a really interesting policy challenge for us to think about in terms of how we motivate them to do otherwise. We've got our apprenticeship level, there's a lot of discussion about broadening that so that they can, of course, can use it more widely. Um, but I'm interested now in our people's reflection and questions. You are the first one. Thank you very much. My name is Felicity Ball, I'm at the University of St. Andrews. I'm director of the Science of Research and the Council of Civility Policy. I'm an expert on employees, so I'm an expert on the So, my question is for Mark. Um, I'm interested to hear from you regarding the kind of some of the main paradoxes that have been discovered in your survey. So, what I heard you say, correct me if I'm wrong, and then you say, say that you had companies who were investing highly in technology, but they couldn't recruit the people. They weren't willing to train their staff internally to have those skills that they couldn't agree for. They had a focus on autonomy, they, but then they had low employee involvement in decision making, although they weren't using technology to be controlled. So for me, that's also, it also all sounds like they're just kind of cast the employees out of the autonomous from all the technology. And that middle bit, as you said, like, what's happening in that middle bit? And um, also, my question is first of all, is this paradoxical to you and what you're going to do next in your research? Because it would be super interesting. Um, I'm not sure if it is paradox, because I think it's going to be paradox. I mean, it certainly struck us as potentially a contradiction. I mean, overall, we thought that in terms of investing in technology, we were surprised. Actually, the findings were more positive than we assumed. Um, I think the biggest um, Tension or contradiction, and we found to the extent that they felt that they need that they fixed basic skill of the problem in terms of the implementation of technology. They said that they had difficulties, but they weren't prepared to invest. But actually, I would take this back to the problem of putting of the employer their system. Yeah, right. There's actually no pressures on employers to train. So I wasn't advocating the employer the system in a way that was really reflecting on policy over the last 30 years. And actually, what the research shows is that there's a problem. In all this in the training system. Yeah. I mean, in terms of what we're doing next, one of the things that struck us, and I should have said this survey was conducted at the end of 2021 into the middle of 2022, and we were surprised at just how positive some of the findings were, particularly in terms of future uh, jobs growth. But we're actually running the second wave of the survey at the moment. Um, the one thing we don't have is the fact that it is an employer survey, so we can't speak about employee. Views. Um, but from a certain sentiment on part of we are drawing in other studies in terms of perspectives and employees, which I do expect to be different to many of us. Thank you. Yes. My name is Jessica Singh from the ANC, and I'm going to call them the Jumping Rights Literature internationally. Um, Jenny, you mentioned the uh, Speaker Bank approach that we have to location of many, and it does give us some degree of flexibility, which is for Germans and Germans. 
the lot more global work that. Um, but one of the biggest problems with this, especially with the medical learning approach, is you know, how do you have the right makes a push and pull to keep people in the life and training system? Um, and I do think we now have theoretically at least the capability to okay, okay, we've got the AI, we can see particularly with people at some point it probably needs a bit of a prompt or companies when they're in a certain situation. Um, because one of the things I've seen very often when I'm looking at the labor market is that people don't really know where to go, they don't know what opportunities are out there. So once you've left school and university, you're pretty much on your own, or you have to go to places for advice which are not always easy to navigate with. So I think an awful lot could be done to be invested in that. And one way to invest in that, and one way of doing that is there are employment insurance schemes in the world, um, which are particularly useful. In situations where you're expecting a little friction in the labor market. So, technology is one of the frictions that we're facing. There's also urban aggression, there's climate change, um, there's population aging, etc. And so, those frictions will require this continuous level of investment, which people can't do with all companies that aren't necessarily you know, pay off front. So, there are schemes um, which connect to unemployment insurance systems that capture people. Um, and enable you to push out policies like that. So it's probably a bit too late for tomorrow's speech. Yeah, it's something that um, I think in the long run we should be thinking about. I'd be fascinated to find out how uh, to start and lead to the more suggestions. So uh, thank you. Um, yes. Can I just follow up on that? I, I assume you're talking about schemes like that security. Where, no. Well, yes, some of them work better than others. Security, yeah. I think, was yeah. connected to, to the government, um, where the Danish, um, instead of providing uh, um, payments where you may be done to, it goes to a level of learning fund. And uh, the, so part of your employment deal is that you have a very stable, strong social safety net, you have a personal learning account. Uh, you don't get the payments and employees can fire them. So there is a, a, a balance of, of responsibilities there. So the state provides safety net, but the, but the individual has the options to continue like long learning because ultimately they have to have learning fund. Yeah. Uh, that thing was presented at the pre and it was rejected. Yeah. yeah. I mean, <laughs> But well, everyone's individual learning accounts have got a scar on huge door. Yes. Um, that happens a lot. And uh, I think mean, that's made obviously nervous about that, but that's not so it's not the lead government. Oh no, no, it's, it's, <laughs> it's not to say that policy shouldn't go there. Yeah. Um, but that's not thank you. But there, I saw a hand down here. Yes. Hi, I'm um, Victoria Sweden from the Employment Media Advice Network, which is a Charles for London network. And, um, mostly working with very vulnerable workers um, needing advice on, uh, on skills and also on uh, legal advice. And I've just got two things really. One is on the first one, you say that the sort of level of females in, in the, that sort of group of work is, is quite a depressing statistic. And I was thinking that missing from perhaps I immediately thought, and I, it didn't come up, and I was wondering what your reflection would be on the sort of role, essentially the reality that robots are never going to replace the females need to give birth. And how that has such a massive impact on both, you know, how how the one is in the home and what time you have, and what could we be doing to really reinforce the ability of women on maternity leave to be building their new skills um, and as they go back into the workplace, particularly based on this statistic, which is the Equality and Human Rights um, Commission report of 2016, which said that three in four mothers said that they had a negative or possibly discriminatory experience during pregnancy, maternity leave, or return to work from maternity leave. And it just I think it, 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 I feel like there would be a bit of an elephant in the room to sort of neglect that aspect of being out in the workplace. And then the second thing is just on the very positive notes from Deline. Um, I literally was sitting here sort of two or three weeks ago just in a room down there with the TUC where they had workers mm -hmm. from Amazon and the Postal Service and others where they were using, uh, they were sort of explaining to everybody in the room how technology had affected their stress and mental well-being and that was particularly in things like I didn't even know that postal services when they come scan and say well the parcel's been delivered that that's now being used to say based on an algorithm you work fast enough and the sort of stress and 
negative that's creating. So I think I'm always kind of keen to remember that there's lots of groups of workers and the very vulnerable ones are definitely not <laughs> bringing so positive about it. And I think we need to make sure that they're you know, not all grouped together because there is a really different experience of how technology is staying in the world and their working lives. When I see London buses being driven somewhat aggressively, I worry that the drivers are being managed by the buses. <laughs> So a couple of things. I think one uh, to your point, uh, the growth mindset. I think it's really important that we we do a survey of five years old in New York City, fifteen years old, and adults, and we can really see uh, how uh, having a growth mindset has an impact on on this whole life of learning discussion that we're saying. When it comes to to uh, women, one thing that, and I think it's it's wonderful to say, you know, the screen is being available. What we're missing is the validation and the recognition by employers. And so I think none of this whole revolution will happen if we don't think about skills based hiring, which is a lot. Uh, talking about some of the ICT uh, jobs that I've been talking about don't need that three to five year, five year uh, bachelor. And, uh, and yet, a lot of employers are extremely reluctant to hire a base on, on these modular learning that we are saying is the future. So I think. I, mean, I have to dis dismay the idea that I'm saying you know, I'm a tech optimist, and I think the only thing is we haven't been, you know, putting this education and world of work on par, and we still have a, a separation of the two. And I think that's where we really need to, first of all, for people, there's not no only one career, particularly for women. Tech is an major. But only if there is from the employer side the validation, the recognition of this of this learning. And we're not there yet. We haven't seen this. It's starting a lot more, I have to say, in the US. That uh, you have, I think, about 13 states now that hire government uh, jobs uh, based on uh, skills rather than than uh, academic qualifications. We're working ourselves now at UCB on the uh, for those of you who know the PISA. Um, survey on PISA for vocational education and training, because what we're trying to do there is to say these, these programs can be as assessed. You can have an international comparison of the knowledge acquired that can be transferable from one sector to another, and both for young people and, and adults, because we need to work on the assurance and the comfort zone of employers. If we don't do that, it's not a government led only effort. They have to feel comfortable. And if I hire this person, I know this person can do this job because even though this person doesn't have the academic qualifications. If I accidentally talk some of that value space by listening, uh, some people are now starting to look for the values of what you need because they can then be trying to see it. And that's actually a really important way to talk about young hires. Uh, uh, that's the driver for them, is the meaning of the job as well. And it's really the duration and flexibility and all of that, but that's really something that we need also to put forward. Now we're fast running out of time, and I'll have to rush from both of soon. Um, but I'm not in any questions from this central block just here. Uh, so, uh, is there anyone apart from Film World Skills Media? Um, anyone there wanting to just make a comment, ask a question? Yeah. Uh, I, I thought I saw a person that one sat next to you, but um, you may have just lifted your hand. <laughs> uh, no, no, no. Yeah, you, yeah you, sorry. Uh, uh, but uh, if not, the gentleman in the big glass and the beard, you've got to love something in the big and beard. It's actually that hair. Uh, yeah. And I think actually from the, from the international level, organization, I actually wanted to make just a comment on what uh, Lisa made, because I think it's a very important point to stress that we also need to bring the private uh, companies in that matchmaking process, you know, to reducing the impacts of the One um, report that McKinsey came on in you know, uh, the last year was or the value of experience, then showing that actually over the lifetime of 50 or 60 percent of what uh, you know employees contribute to their companies is based on experience, not on the academic you have the potential. But this is not valued. It's intangible in a sense, you know. And so so tax solution could be good to help to identify and help you know the, the, the transition making easier. And I think I would talk to the agreement that we may be kind of seeing about your yeah. standards and that's that's interesting. I'm gonna go with Two more 
comments, questions, and then I'm going to ask each one of the three of you to give a sort of one minute summary, final favor, and then stop. So, we built around 2,500 million dollars piece of fixed infrastructure, and um, backed by, amongst other people, Samuel and me, and other airports and the team. Um, my question refers to the comments about theory of application and how these come up in education, particularly post graduate STEM education. And what we observed is around about 100 years of being studied about that, and, and the knowledge of energy seems to be focused on tech transfer policy. I would, I would argue that the last word on our communication team is thinking about skills that must potentially um, force that problem rather than the transfer policy, where um, perhaps knowledge generation, knowledge generation and knowledge application of the skills still there. One thing that I would say is we design the PhD very much specifically for inventors, but it's about how you combine and apply the knowledge. And we saw this as a funny push for the research and the original backup of PhD programs. They found this way and said we got these better funding from the okay. So clearly there is interest in doing this at each age. But I wonder to what extent we have the work right funding in place to enable this kind of uh, diversification of uh skill that we should especially to get like the founding innovation like sent, you know, as a different of organization skills. Thank you very much, Mr. So um yeah, hi. Um John Mahons, I'm uh, managing director of the special projects of a brand strategy company called Profit. And um, we, uh, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, I, I'm in a luxurious position where I get to design training for a lot of companies across the world, and mostly blue chips. Um, and um, that means that I get to um, experiment with people a little bit. Um, and one of the things that we discovered a long time ago was that uh, we were running a program for a large white goods company, um, maybe 22,000 employees, is that, that when you um, introduce rewards into a learning program, you change the dynamics of the entire process. And um, since then, uh, that got us onto a part of, with a chat with Alfie Cohen, I don't know if anyone knows him, but he wrote a book called Punishment by Rewards. Mm -hmm. And um, because he sees that the idea of rewards is a, is, is a sort of the other side of the punishment coin is when you're not being rewarded, you're being punished. And um, it's something that we've actually taken in, in terms of the qualifications, what have you, we take that as our training because we find it such a damaging component in how it is that people uh, learn and why it is they learn, the meaning behind their learning. And I just wondered what the panel's view on this um, need to qualify um, versus the lifelong learning mentality. Yes. Good. All right, let's start at this end and look and work back. So just those the comments. Yes, uh, and any, any reaction? Yeah. Um, there were very interesting points that were raised. Just want to make a couple of points, I guess, in conclusion. The first is just to reiterate the point that there's still a lot to do in terms of motivating employers to invest in skills and to utilise these skills of their workforces to achieve their full potential. But what I found particularly interesting in terms of the discussion today is this turn to work on the um, And it reminds me of the debates we had in the late 90s, early 2000s, that we have to be careful that life and learning is seen as the responsibility of the but the responsibility needs to be shared between the individual, between employers and the state. Um, this is, I think, it's really important. And when this was a live issue, um, going back 20 years, there were quite a lot of other bodies involved in the sort of life and learning agenda, like trade unions and the labour and which introduced the union loan fund. I think it might be something with something like that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, in so many ways. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish with um, two competing forces here. I think we have a workforce that, for the most part, and Dana remain to be really properly rigorously analysed, enjoy the concept of mastering. Mastering new skills, succeeding, is, is an opportunity. But it is countered by fear. Fear of failure, fear of, fear of being shown up to be not as good as you thought you were, or not as good as you need to be, uh, fear of being monitored. So the, these themes are coming out. 
And also in that is a fear that you can't even ask your employer to get you to that sense of mastery. So I agree we shouldn't leave it to the individual, I agree we shouldn't leave it to the firm. We need an overarching structure that means that we can maximise mastery, minimise fear, and acknowledge the stratification across which this works. The gendered aspects, we won't get equal gender participation until we start talking about parental leave instead of maternity leave. We, we, we have to consider the age stratification. Everyone who we've interviewed so far has said young people find this easy, older people don't. And these people were not old. <laughs> so I'm going to handle that because I think that's all well. Oh, well, I'll be there. One minute. I'm I'm not your time. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm going to the idea of, uh, or, or the key again to look at that skills uh, as a bundle of skills. So we particularly when we talk about AI skills, the talk is often about those technical skills. So there is no point if you don't have the critical thinking to interpret the the, 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 the information coming out from the AI. If you don't have the problem solving skills to ask the right question, none of this uh, makes any sense. So that's one thing. The other thing I think is to your point about human agency is if we can try to change the narrative about no longer talking about the talent pipeline. And I agree with you, the always constantly on the individual. You need to be a, a learner from cradle to grave. You need to be resilient. You need to continue learning constantly. People are not only the workforce. Sort of, it's not just about making sure that we have enough people to fill these jobs. And I think that the narrative is very much about this talent pipeline. I've been really discussing so much earlier. It doesn't really allow the people, it's actually it's a lot of fear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. right. And then the last thing it also perhaps about the nuance about the, uh, the impact, which, uh, you know, that AI may be displacing completely or partly on the job. We did a, a recent uh, research on language professionals and with machine translations. You would think that they would completely disappear. There's no point, we we'll just put it in. And actually, if we looked at the past 10 years, that uh, they just are using different skills. They're doing much more technical uh, um, translations, they're more, doing a lot more complicated anything, it's much more knowledge complex. So the, the, uh, it's much more nuanced, and I think that's something we want to send through. Yeah, that's yeah. uh, GPT's ability to code does not mean that we don't need coders. So, so, yeah. so thank you so much. Uh, it's been a very interesting, thank you, I'm ranging discussion for me and your obsessed about these things that might not really narrow the thing. Um, yeah, a few things just uh, for me to pick up on. Um, I'm waiting for a, a university to start to offer a subscription around an ongoing service um, as a not only a new income stream, but also an ability to then offer uh, coaching and mentoring and career advice uh, and the ability to build up back into the campus and to relearn. And I think there's something interesting to explore there. Um, I think what you were saying, the question about knowledge application, um, I think is is really interesting um, that we, we don't value it enough, we're obsessed by theory, um, and we don't put enough investment and value into that. Um, the shared responsibility between the individual, the employer, and the state, very um, I will certainly take away. And then finally, publications feel like there's a handbrake on skills uh, because they take very long to develop and they're never really up to date uh, unless they're lucky. Um, and yeah, we, we kind of feel like we need them. The, the technology opportunity is to capture experience what we can do in real time and be able to then reflect that and it doesn't mean you don't then don't need training that you can bolt into that caption but potentially we can start to reflect the reality of what we can do without needing a qualification as the currency for what we can do uh, and that's a really exciting opportunity so that's something to finish with. Um, thank you very much for having me on the on the Evolve and Evolve Migration Bill. And uh, see you all in the course of time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.